Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Tennessee Farm Bureau kickoff webinar. We're honored and grateful you have joined us to learn more about important topics to expect in 2023 and beyond. We're excited to have 31 counties with us for our webinar this evening. You should have received some information prior to the webinar about our format looking slightly different this year. Instead of one long video being played and then questions following, we're going to play a few quick videos about issues we want you to be aware of, and then following each video, we'll have time for questions about that topic. Feel free to send those questions in as the video plays. We'll also have some time at the end for questions as needed. We've already been busy this year. 190 folks from Tennessee went to Puerto Rico for the American Farm Bureau Convention. We had a productive ag industry partner meeting, a new county president's training and a successful bell ringer event in Nashville, but there's still much more to come. This, this webinar is aimed at preparing you for what lies ahead for agriculture and Farm Bureau in 2023. Tonight, we're going to focus on four topics. First, farmland loss. Secondly, Tennessee's land grant university, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, followed by some pertinent national issues like the upcoming farm bill. And finally, our 2023 state priority issues. But before we get too deep in, the, in those topics, we wanna share a few details about our five year strategic plan, which starts this year. I was proud to appoint a committee last year of volunteer leaders to develop this strategic plan which was also endorsed by our voting delegates in December. I think what we came up with is something we can all be very proud of and look forward to accomplishing. To highlight a few key items, I invite Radonna Rose, our executive vice president, to share a few details. Ms. Rose. Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. <clears throat> There's an old saying, if an organization isn't continuously improving, then it's slowly dying. Our goal every year is to make Tennessee Farm Bureau organization better than it was the year before. There's always room for improvement. We don't just wish for success, we actively and strategically plan for it. You should have a copy of the new strategic plan included on your webinar agenda. The plan is simple, clear, and has four key focus areas. First, agriculture sustainability enhancing opportunities for future generations. Second, grassroots engaging county members. Third, education and promotion, communicating the value of Farm Bureau and agriculture. And fourth, organizational resiliency, maintaining organization relevance. We urge you to hold your organization and your staff accountable and focused on the identified priorities. And don't just set the plan on a shelf, but keep it at the forefront of every Farm Bureau activity. We also encourage you and your County Farm Bureau to plan and develop your goals around the strategic plan. Our mission, our vision, our core values and our goals all unite us. And we accomplish so much more working together. And remember another old saying, none of us are as smart as all of us. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Our first topic and one noticed all across the state is the rapid farmland loss we're experiencing. On the rise for the last several years, but especially the last few, it has many of us concerned and rightfully so, as Tennessee is currently the third fastest state in losing farmland. We're proud the Tennessee Department of Agriculture and the University of Tennessee Institute for Agriculture is partnering to study the rate of farmland loss across the state. Here's a look at what they're focusing on, and after they wrap up, we'll take live questions on farmland loss. Send those questions to 931-262-2477, and be sure to include your county name. Here's a video. My name is Charlie Martinez. I'm the director for the UT Center of Farm Management at UT. And, and currently right now we're working on a project in conjunction with TDA and stakeholders across our state to understand and better, under, better understand uh, farmland conversion in Tennessee. 
Uh, historically speaking, farmers uh, have uh, thought of, long thought, hey, we're losing land. What does that mean for us, not only now, but in the future? And so that's what we want to better understand, not only for our producers, but what does it mean for the Tennessee economy uh, in the coming years? Uh, I believe their report came out a couple years ago and it labeled Tennessee as number four. And then uh, recently it's been moved up to the number three threatened state in terms of uh, a state that's been identified that can have farmland conversion occur at a you know, high rate and they're the most uh, vulnerable uh, to that occurring. And so when we hear that for us in agriculture, we need to get a good hold on what does that mean for our state and for our producers. And historically speaking, we've only known about data that comes by way of the census or the American Farmland Trust. But in the past couple of months, we've been actually collecting data from the comptroller's office and from counties around the state to quantify acres over the last five years to understand which counties are losing acres and at what pace and at what speed, but also uh, trying to understand better farm acres, greenbelt acres, industrial uh, type acreage count, and what does that mean for our producers in the coming years. And hopefully we then can quantify and gather other data to estimate the value of acreage loss to the Tennessee ag economy. So it's a lot easier to keep land if it's making money, right? So uh, at the end of the day, the more if, you're, if we're profitable, that land's more likely to stay in agriculture. And, then, uh, and that's what we're really shooting for at the center, helping people be profitable and sustainable in that profitability for not, for not only now, but in the years to come. I think we can, we can strike a balance between urbanization and farming and forestry, uh, but it's gonna be difficult. I mean, we, how do you do that? You do that by the stakeholders coming together and at least talking about it. But, but the realization too, that uh, Stuart McWhorter is aware of it, and I think you're going to hear the same thing from Butch Ely because, and that comes from the governor. They know that rural matters to him, and they're going to fall in line, as well as everybody on the cabinet, because that's where the stage is set. Thank you to both Dr. Martinez and Commissioner Hatcher for their commitment and work in combating this issue. Be on the lookout for a new dashboard where you'll be able to search county specific data. We'll be sure to share that information when it's available. Now, if you have any questions about farmland loss, please send them in at this time to 931-262-2477. And we do have a first question of the night uh, regarding farmland laws, why do some counties have in, have data and some counties do not on land laws? Ms. Fredonna. Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. And if you were one of those nine counties that uh, indicated in the video that uh, that there was not any data, that you were probably among those that are wondering why. And the reason is, is the uh, Division of Property Assessment works with uh, all the, the 95 counties with the exception of nine in collecting all of the property assessment data and, and sending out notices and that kind of things to the counties. So those nine counties have their own programs and therefore we didn't have access or the University of Tennessee didn't have access to get their information, but they are working with the counties individually to try to get that information so that the, the data can be complete and actually represent all 95 counties. So that's a, a progress or a, uh, we're still in progress in trying to get that information. Thank you for that explanation. So no further questions on that at the moment. Uh, and we'll have plenty of time at the end if you think of one uh, as we go along. But to transition into our next topic, Tennessee's land grant university, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. No doubt the relationship between the University of Tennessee and Farm Bureau runs deep. Our organization was started by efforts of UT Extension agents. And throughout the past hundred years, our entities have worked together to find real life solutions to issues farmers in Tennessee face. Recently, I had the privilege to sit down with President Randy Boyd of UT to discuss the new leadership transition at UTIA and some of our concerns our members have had regarding UT. If you have any questions about our discussion, please send them in during the video and we'll answer them thereafter. Here's our conversation.
our goal in asking you to join us here today is to bring awareness, knowledge, and understanding of what's going on at the University of Tennessee. So if it's okay with you, let's start with your leadership change. Just uh, last uh, January, you made a leadership change at the UTIA. Tell us about that new hire and uh, what we might expect from that. Well, if I could just start off by saying, President Mayberry, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk with the members of the Farm Bureau. As you said, the Farm Bureau has been just an incredible partner to the University of Tennessee for 100 years. Um, and just in my four years here, every time we turn around, the Farm Bureau is by our side helping us to get major initiatives done, whether it's getting 32 new uh, extension agents across the state, asking the governor for support. Farm Bureau was by our side asking for that support, and we won. We wanted to get 4-H students some time off um, and for excused absences, and for, uh, Farm Bureau was our partner in that, and just countless ways that the Farm Bureau works with the University of Tennessee. So I just want to say thank you for the partnership and also thank you for the opportunity to have a chance to, to uh, share some thoughts today and answer some questions that you and the, some of your members have. With regards to our new leadership, we couldn't be more excited. Um, Keith Carver, uh, he's got deep roots in the state of Tennessee. He's been all over the University of Tennessee. He's worked at the UT Health Science Center. He's worked at UT Knoxville. He worked with Joe T. Pietro, um, that, uh, also who came from UTIA. So he's got a great understanding of uh, uh, UTIA and the, the UT system. And then he spent the last six years at UT Martin, a great, uh, with, with a great college of ag. He understands agriculture across our state. He's just a, a dynamic, peaceful person. He'll be out in the community listening and talking to people and we just couldn't be more excited, as you could tell. But we couldn't, but we couldn't be more excited about having Keith in this role. Well, we certainly share that excitement. It's been a very, very positive and breath of fresh air out in Farm Bureau country, and we, and we, are, we are ready to work with him. As, as, as our members know, he'll be serving on our state board of directors as an ex officio member, and so we are we're looking forward to doing that. Our first meeting will be coming up in March, and so uh, I already made contact with him, and we're, we're good to go there. So in interest, interest of time, uh, let's, let's go straight to discussing some, some policy positions that we might, might discuss. In December, as you know, our voting delegates added some language uh, for us to work with the General Assembly to refocus the University of Tennessee on agriculture. And uh, there's been concern that unification has or weakened UTIA after it was combined with UTK. Uh, is, that, is that happening? Yeah, you know, that, I'll, I'll take uh, total 100% responsibility for that misinterpretation or misperception um, because it is a misperception. But, you know, I'm in charge of making sure that people know what's happening. And if I didn't do a good job, then that's my fault. So I thank you for this opportunity to kind of let people know all the great things that are happening. And I will contest that this has been the, la the best three years of UTIA's history. There's been so many incredible positive things happening so far this decade. And we're determined, and we talk about this all the time, we're determined to make this the greatest decade in the history of the University of Tennessee, and we can't do that if it's not also the greatest decade in the Institute of Agriculture's history. So let's just hit the four key areas that the Institute is focused on. So let's start with extension. I'm the first president that's ever made all 95 counties, and I say that not to brag, but I am kind of proud of making them, but it was an opportunity to listen to the folks on the front lines and get their input. And because of that input, they gave me over 300 wishes, things they wanted to see done. And one of the most important things was they wanted to make sure we had no split agents. We had 32 counties, our poorest counties, that only had two agents trying to do three jobs, family and consumer science, or consumer science uh, ag agent, and 4-H. We had, all the, in those counties, two people doing three jobs, and they just, they just simply couldn't do it. And so everywhere across the state, people were begging for more support. With your support, along with the other folks in the Commission on Ag, we were able to go to the governor and get 32 new agents. So from an extension point of view, we've never been better staffed. So that was a really important step forward. One of the things we're working on is improving extension offices across the, the, the state. 10 extension offices, have, and we're doing this, of course, with our county partners, have been either uh, improved or completely rebuilt. I mean, we've got a goal of doing even more of those. And then of those wishes, we also got um, a lot of wishes saying we just need some infrastructure. We need a new copying machine or we need new support for some of our 4-H. So we got them funding. So that was, that was big on extension. We got a lot more to do, but it's been a great start to, for extension over the last three years. With regards to uh, ag research, our research increased last year up 12% from 70 million where it had been flat for two years 
up to 80 million, a new record in the amount of research. We also had a, a record number of awards, a 222% increase in the number of awards that we got last year. So that's, that's almost unheard of, but that was an incredible uh, positive. And kind of, I like to travel, I like to get around the state. And uh, when I finished the, going to see the extension offices, uh, Dr. Hong Wei Shen said, well, that's really swell that you did that. But by the way, we have 10 ag, ag research centers you haven't been to. And I think he kind of conspired, but everyone I went to all had the same wish. We, we need more infrastructure. So he happened to have a list. It's kind of like that Eddie, that cousin Eddie moment in the Christmas vacation. But I said, Do you have, well, what would you need? Well, I just happen to have a list. <laughs> and, uh, but it totaled up $50 million. Uh, we went to uh, our great friend and one of my bosses, a, a trustee um, and commissioner, Charlie Hatcher, and with his help, and with Farm Bureau's help, we were able to get $50 million in ARP funds last year for our, our, our research center. So they're doing more uh, with research. They're producing more uh, grants, helping our farmers with the research they're doing. They got uh, more equipment. One of the biggest things that we hear at the Commission on Ag is we need um, more workers, more talent. And so big part of our job is just to produce more students. Last year, our enrollment increased 8.5%. We had more students at the Col Herbert College of Ag than ever before. Our retention is going up. Um, so we're real proud of the growth that we're having there. And that's, that's, that's obviously a really important thing. The University of Tennessee Knoxville has provided $11.7 million back to UTIA for new faculty in some key areas that, that our state desperately needs. And then finally, to say at the College of Veterinary Medicine, in the last three years, we've been putting a lot of focus on growing them. One of the things I hear across the state is we need more large animal vets. We need more vets, period. And we especially need them in the rural areas. And uh, the best way we can help solve for that is just produce more vet, veterinarians. And so we're increase, increasing enrollment from 340 to 480 over the next three years. So it's about a 41% increase in the number of vets that we're going to be able to produce for the state. There's been some exciting things happening. We haven't seen anything yet. We've got even bigger plans ahead. And it's my fault that I haven't done a good enough job of sharing that excitement and all those very specific things that have gotten so much better in the last three years. So a lot of good things happening, but with respect to unification, if you were going to do it today, is there anything you'd do differently? Well, great question. You know, obviously I know a, a, a lot of people across the state that I didn't know four years ago that I would always seek out through advice and counsel on any big future decisions. Um, I've done a lot of consultation after the fact. It's always better to do before the fact. A good leader manages change. That's probably the number one skill they have to have because the fact is things are going to change. The, the, uh, avoiding change is not an option. The world changes, organizations have to change. We've got to keep making sure that we're in a position to be able to be successful. But the key to uh, managing change is being a good change manager. And the key to that is being consultative, talking to people, listening, making sure you get as much input as possible. So what do you say to those who believe unification has, result, has resulted in UTIA moving in the wrong direction uh, with morale and its service to farmers? Yes, so I think that the, if they say that, it's because I haven't shared with them this, these facts. And I want to make sure that this information I just shared with you, we can put in a written form and we can distribute to everybody. So they've actually got the facts in front of them. With regards to morale, um, morale can go up and down, but I can tell you I had somebody ask me just a, uh, a few weeks ago, you know, you should do an anonymous engagement survey. Conveniently, we did one in December. And of all the University of Tennessee um, units, the Institute of Agriculture was, the, I think, about the third highest. And it was kind of unfair because number one and two were really small units. But of the larger units, Institute of Ag was number one in morale. So overall, I think our teammates, our colleagues uh, in the Institute are seeing all these positive things and are feeling pretty good about it. But that doesn't mean that we want to try to do more. One of the things that um, we're going to be doing uh, here in the very near future is a compensation study. One of our big challenges and one of the things that when you look at these engagement studies that everybody complains about is compensation. But that was in pretty much every organization every day. I've never been to an organization where people say, you know, we're really paid too much around here. But, uh, but the fact is um, the cost of living is going up really fast and so we've got to uh, do an understand or get an understanding of exactly where we need to make sure that we keep our employees and not just keep them but make them happy and give them a good great quality of life. So that's, that's underway. Mm -hmm. One thing I've learned my first year's presidency, nothing picks up morale better than a pay raise. I yes. can tell you that for sure. So I understand that very well. So one thing we, we find in, in our organization when we're trying to talk about the University of Tennessee is, is Tennessee is our land-grant university. 
and UTIA, can, can you explain how that structure is? Yeah, one of the things that I've been talking about since I've got here and putting it at the forefront of the University of Tennessee is the fact that we are the land grant university. One of two, my good friends with TSU, of course, is our, our second land grant. And I, if I sometimes fail to mention them, uh, President Glover will remind me. So I'll always make sure that we call out uh, TCU, our great partner at our extension offices. But in 1862, when Abraham Lincoln announced the land grant university and signed the Morrill Act into, into, into being, you know, one of the things that he charges with is to be a university that provi would provide a ladder up to the working class and to the middle class, being more accessible to more people, not some elite institution, but make it more accessible. One of the things that we did a couple of years ago is introduce something called the UT Promise, which says if your family income is under $60,000, which is half the population, then you can come free of tuition fees to any of our, our campuses. So that's a big part of, of, of fulfilling that. It, also, we were charged with being a university that focused on agriculture, on commerce, on the mechanical sciences, which is engineering, and on the military sciences. And at the forefront of that, the anchor of that, is our agricultural um, uh, focus. And so we take that very seriously. We've got uh, of our trustees. There's a lot of industries and people that we rec uh, have to be responsible for, but the only one constitutionally that is always represented is the Commissioner of Agriculture. So it's a key part of who we are and our identity. And we're here, unlike, there's a lot of universities that are great. You know, you can be a private elite university and provide really smart kids with really great educations they'll go across the world and make a difference. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but we're here to serve the people of Tennessee. That's our primary job. The number one industry in the state of Tennessee is agriculture. If we're not supporting agriculture, we're not doing our job. So uh, we take the land grant university mission and our mission to serve agriculture very importantly. It's at the core of what we do. I think that's what our grassroots, grassroots leaders really believe that the university sure. should be focused on. I think no, that's part of, the, part of the point we had in December. So. They're 100% they're, they're correct. Yep. So let's try a quick fact check, okay. speed round, okay. about unification and other things. So UTIA is moving, this is true or false, UTIA is moving into a regional extension model, eliminating the county-based model. No, I'm not sure where that was, it's false. False, false. Unification allows UTIA research dollars to be commingled with UT Knoxville research dollars. No, in fact, research dollars and other dollars from UT Knoxville is actually moving into UTIA. All right. Centralizing the UTIA budget process allows the senior vice president, senior vice chancellor to determine county funding levels. The county funding levels are determined by the county, but the, uh, the funding that UTIA puts into each county is first um, recommended by the dean, but always the dean would report up to the senior vice chancellor. The, the dean doesn't work independently, so before or after, the deans will still always report up to the senior vice chancellor. County extension personnel are not to attend, visit with elected officials, and attend county farm bureau events without prior approval from Knoxville. Yeah, that's false, and uh, the uh, UTIA just sent a memo, I'm not sure how that got around, but they sent a memo out uh, about three weeks ago to clarify that very specifically. Again, sometimes these things get out there that aren't true and uh, when we find out about it, we can either set the record straight or explain them. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a little bit about the past and way back in the past and, and, uh, and what's going on right now. Let's uh, please share your vision for the UT system and UTI moving forward. What can uh, some of the short term goals be? Uh, how does UTIA reach that vision? And maybe more importantly, how can Farm Bureau help? Oh, you can help a lot. And so I'll say broadly, we're gonna make this the greatest decade in the Institute of Agriculture, uh, which could potentially make it the greatest decade in agriculture in the state of Tennessee if we're doing our job well. We've been three years into it. We started a strategic plan in 2018, a year before I got here. Um, all the strategic plans of each of the different divisions at the College of Vet Med, uh, uh, extension research and Co Herbert College are all on different cycles. Our new leader, Keith Carver, is going to have everybody reset all together. This year in 2023 will be a year of re envisioning. And so I've got a lot of ideas and I've talked with some of our leaders. One would be let's double research. Research impacts agriculture. We support our, our farmers by doing better research. Let's go from 80 million to 150 million. Herbert College, we're the smallest college of agriculture and a land grant university in the country. If 
one of the things we're supposed to do is produce talent for agriculture, we need to do better. So let's triple the uh, enrollment at, in the College of Agriculture. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that I could talk about that I would like for us to do, but I want to hear what people, what people think that we should do. So we're going to go to our customers, our stakeholders, our employees at the Institute of Agriculture, to Farm Bureau, and people all across the state. Uh, Keith Carver is going to lead that initiative. Starting this year, we're going to be doing a statewide initiative to get input and help let everybody help us envision that greatest decade and make sure that not only are we uh, uh, doing the things that we need to do internally, but externally to make sure everybody's uh, excited and uh, uh, supported by the, this new vision. Well, we're certainly excited at the Farm Bureau and out in, in rural Tennessee. And then I know the agriculture community appreciates everything you guys do in our land grant university. We appreciate your time today. We thank you so much for today, but, but every day that you work for us. And uh, we, we can't, uh, can't, uh, can't hardly wait to get started in this new, new leaf we've turned here with, uh, with Chancellor Carver coming in. Thank you so much for your time. President Mayberry, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Again, we want to thank President Moore for taking time to address our concerns and hopefully provide some insight on the future of the entire UT system. So we've got a couple of questions uh, at this point. I think both of them probably came in probably prior to the end of the video. So the video may have already answered these questions uh, well enough. But, uh, but the first question was, why did the Chancellor of Agriculture change? And I think you heard President Boyd in the video talk about how he has to manage change. Uh, you know, it's it, a uh, situation where he felt like, I think Dr. Carver would be a better fit uh, I think in his words that nobody bats a thousand. He, he's made some really good hires, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. But I think we're all very excited, uh, Chancellor Carver, to come in and uh, pick up the torch and carry on. And I think we're very excited about that, that change. And the second question is, why weren't the stakeholders like Tennessee Soy, Corn, Cotton, and other groups consulted before unification? And that question comes from Henderson County. Well, I think, well, uh, all regards if anybody knows that uh, the unification was pretty much a done deal before anybody was contacted. Uh, it was a decision they made and you heard in the video that uh, President Boyd, when I asked him if he had it to do over, uh, I think that was an indication that all the people that he uh, went and visited uh, after the fact, if you will, uh, I think he pretty well admits that's a mistake. It's on him. Uh, but I think it, uh, that's water under the bridge at this point, and uh, I think we're all ready to move forward. So hopefully that answers the questions. If it's not, send us another one, and we'll give another shot at it. All right, moving on to the next subject. As I'm sure most of you know, we have a farm bill to pass this year. It's obviously one of our top national priorities, and the American Farm Bureau is also focused heavily on making sure we get it across the finish line before year's end. AFBF Executive Vice President Joby Young and Senior Director of Government Affairs, Andrew Walmsley, will share info on the Farm Bill, and then Kristen Walker of our Public Policy Division will share some other national issues to be aware of. Hi, I'm Joby Young. I'm the Executive Vice President of the American Farm Bureau Federation. And I'm uh, just just surpassed the first six months of my time here at American Farm Bureau, and uh, it's a special time to join Farm Bureau because the Farm Bill's coming up this year, and uh, I've worked on the last uh, two Farm Bills on on Capitol Hill and then at USDA, and as you all know, uh, as well as I do, the Farm Bill is a critical piece of legislation. Every title of the Farm Bill Farm Bill has pieces pieces of policy that are that are critical for agriculture in rural America, but there are certainly some, some top line priorities uh, for this year's debate, and, and that includes things like maintaining a unified farm bill, uh, the nutrition portion of the farm bill and, and, and the uh, farm uh, program aspect of the farm bill, those need to be maintained as a, as a unified approach. That's a, that's a time-tested, uh, effective approach to the farm bill, and, and we certainly think that needs to continue. Maintaining the risk, uh, risk management tools and the safety net uh, aspects of the Farm Bill are critical. Of course, crop insurance is a big part of that. Maintaining that funding uh, that goes to those farm programs and, and, the, and the risk management tools therein is, is a critically important piece. Ensuring that conservation uh, programs are market-based and, and, and are, are pursued in partnership 
uh, with farmers and ranchers across the country is another thing we're going to be talking about. And, and we hope that everybody out there, all of our members across the country, make sure to share their personal stories about how all of these things help them on the farm. So it's, it's critically important that as we talk about these things, that, uh, that, that members and farmers and ranchers across the country whether it's at a meeting or in an office of a lawmaker or invite them to their farm or their ranch to show them how these, how these, all these priorities come to bear on, on their farms and affect their, their farm business and their farm families. The current farm bill will expire in September. Uh, I think it's going to be a heavy lift to, to, to get a new farm bill done by then. Um, so probably need a little short-term extension, but, but definitely a pathway and a need to get a farm bill done this year. Uh, when you look at all the challenges from you know, geopolitical and trade to you know, high input costs for producers, you know, those type of items are what make up the farm bill. But it's going to take uh, farmers, ranchers, Farm Bureau members uh, advocating and educating these new members of Congress. There's 260 new members of Congress that wasn't here for the 2018 Farm Bill. So it's a poor frog who won't croak for their own pond. And so, you know, AFPF is going to be putting out resources to states, continue to do that um, to help our members educate Congress on the importance of farm policy. In addition to the 2023 Farm Bill, we also want you to be aware of a few other national issues and updates. The first one is the ongoing discussion regarding WOTUS, or Waters of the U.S. For several years, past administrations have been trying to determine just how much federal jurisdiction the EPA has under the Clean Water Act. On December 30th, 2022, the Biden administration released their definition of Waters of the U.S., and unfortunately, this new rule brings us back to the Obama-era rule, creating more complicated regulations and uncertainty for farmers. It is also important to note this new rule was announced while we're still waiting on a ruling from the Supreme Court on Sackett versus EPA, which will determine how much regulatory authority the EPA has on waters of the U.S. The decision in this case could send the definition of WOTUS straight back to the drawing board. There will still be an opportunity to participate in a public comment period about the new Biden rule, and we will share that info when it becomes available. On a more positive note, however, John Deere and American Farm Bureau just signed a memorandum of understanding ensuring farmers have the right to repair their farm equipment. This gives farmers access to diagnostic and repair codes, manuals and product guides, and the ability to purchase diagnostic tools directly from John Deere while still protecting their intellectual property rights. AFBF hopes this agreement with John Deere will lead to similar agreements with other equipment manufacturers. Lastly, a topic for those livestock producers, the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service is seeking comments on the use of electronic identification ear tags as official identification for cattle and bison. This rule would require all official ear tags for cattle and bison to be readable, both visually and electronically. Animals subject to the use of these tags include all cattle and bison 18 months of age or older, all dairy cattle, and cattle and bison used for shows, exhibitions, rodeos, or recreational events. Animals not impacted by this rule include any cattle or bison tagged with official non-EID tags before the effective date of the rule, animals already tagged with an official EID tag, animals that do not cross state lines, cattle and bison under the age of 18 months, and animals going to slaughter. The comment period is open to the public until March 20th, and the rule will go into effect six months after the final rule is published. Tennessee Farm Bureau policy supports a voluntary national identification program while maintaining the confidentiality of producer information. If you have any questions regarding the upcoming Farm Bill or any federal issues, we encourage you to send them in at this time. Thank you. All right, we'll now take questions regarding the, the 2023 Farm Bill and any national issues. Just a reminder, those uh, text those questions to 931-262-2477. And uh, please put, put your county in there as well. We look like we've got one coming in with this segment. Uh, so any information on the proposed bill regarding foreign business or governments buying land? And so at this time, I'll ask Kevin Hensley, if he would, to, to answer that question. That is coming from Houston County. It's a very timely uh, question that we've had. The bill that at the state level that's come in 
it was actually on calendar this past week. It was rolled two weeks um, to, to come up with some amendments and have some different discussions. Um, this, is a, this is an issue that um, we actually don't have a specific policy on. Um, when this issue has been discussed uh, and in different years, there's kind of been two sides of the story. There's always been lots of concern about making sure that uh, people from or in communist China doesn't buy Tennessee farmland. But then there's also been discussions about, uh, you know, if making sure that we don't take away private property rights. And then also at the same time, when when these bills have been discussed in the past, it was a blanket um it was blanket legislation that impacted even existing companies. So there's companies that have been in, in Tennessee for a long time, like Aviagen, um, that are good partners in the state that a lot of farmers in Tennessee grow with, but they actually have some company owned uh, farmland uh, in the state of Tennessee. And so there's, all, there's never been a good specific consensus in Farm Bureau about what our position ought to be at the state level. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on in just about every state uh, in, in, across the country, and then also a big focus in D.C. on this. And so I think this is a topic that we'll, we will see something happen uh, this year, and then I think it's something that this summer in the policy development process, I hope we have another discussion on uh, throughout this year, but there's a lot of discussion about this. And so on a, on a specific proposed bill, there is some state legislation, and there are some le there's legislation at the federal level too, and we'll be tracking those and providing updates updates though to those as we go. Mr. Mayberry. Thanks, Kevin. All right, we've got another question from Dyer County. Can we assist in forming a greenhouse gas reduction program? Renewable fuels made from Tennessee corn and soybeans have a proven record of decreasing the greenhouse gas in some of our country's biggest cities. State policies and states to our north are more aggressive than our national policies. And I'll ask Kevin to come back on that one as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. Yeah, that's a, that's definitely a, a something that you see in the Midwestern states that the states have some specific policies that um, encourage the use of um, whether it be ethanol or or biodiesel. Um, those policies all have it. We don't have those type of things at the state level. Um, there are a lot of discussions going on, and and, and I don't have the, the numbers in front of me, but actually the the, the Biden administration released last week uh, the renewable fuel standards for the country for the next three years. Um, to give credit where credit's due, the Biden administration uh, has done that. That was something the Trump administration was never able to do in their time. And, and many times uh, administrations have kicked the can down the road on that issue, and they've released that for the next three years. There's a lot of interesting things happening in that field uh, when it comes to a lot of us are aware of biodiesel, but then there's also uh, kind of a new type biodiesel that's commonly referred to as re renewable biodiesel. And there's a lot of investment and in research going on into avian, avian, um, avian, aviation, excuse me, have avian influenza on the mind, but uh, a lot of, a lot of research going on in aviation fuel uh, for those type products to decrease the, the carbon impact from those fuels. So there's a lot going on there. I appreciate the question and look forward to those discussions in the future. Mr. Mayberry. Great job, Kevin. All right, I think that's the last for the moment anyway on that particular issue. And just uh, be, if you think of something in between, we'll still have time at the end. Our last issue and certainly not the least, if we want you to know our organization's priority issues for this year's, this the Tennessee General Assembly this year. We hope many of you have learned and advocated for those at the issues at our bell ringer recently but we welcome some other members of our public policy division to provide a brief summary of our state policy for issues for 2023. Here's a video. Hello everybody, I'm Kevin Hensley with the public policy division and I'm joined by Shelby Vinoy, the newest member of our team. And we're gonna be discussing state issues that we'll be dealing with in the General Assembly. Shelby, why don't you start us off? Sure, so we have four main issues that we're gonna be discussing this year. And the first comes in the form of a joint resolution between the House and the Senate. We are pursuing a constitutional amendment to prohibit a statewide property tax. We're jumping into a multi-year effort with this one. And then the first General Assembly, it has to receive just a simple majority. And then in the 114th General Assembly, we'll come back with the exact same language and we will be seeking a two-thirds majority. And from there, it will go on the ballot at the next governor's election, where it will have to receive another majority of those who cast their vote in the governor's election. 
Uh, this year we are looking at House Joint Resolution 81 and Senate Joint Resolution 158, um, which is that constitutional amendment to prohibit a statewide property tax. Uh, the property tax was repealed in 1949 and currently property taxes are imposed at the local level um, at rates set by your county and municipal governments. There are currently no needs for a statewide property tax, but this is a proactive measure we're taking to prevent this from being a cash grab down the road if we fall upon hard times. And we're just looking to assure that Tennessee property owners um, are not going to have to face yet another tax on the property they own. There are only seven states that collect property tax on the state level, and we aim to seek that Tennessee never finds its way on that list. Our second priority issue we want to talk about is an issue to clarify provision in the Greenbelt Law. There was a situation that came up where a farmer uh, enrolled, their fa enrolled part of their property into a conservation program through the federal government. Based off how that worked out, the farmer actually had to pay rollback taxes because the, the land became ineligible for Greenbelt according to the specific standards set in state law. We want to make sure that when a farmer enrolls their property in conservation programs with the federal government that one, they're not ineligible for Greenbelt anymore, and then two, that they wouldn't have to pay rollback taxes. We don't think this applies to most programs that the federal government um, and we're used to farmers enrolling with, um, like CRP and things like that, but we want to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. Our third priority issue of the year isn't exactly one specific bill, but there'll be multiple discussions that we'll be involved in as uh, a farm organization, and that deals with local government's ability to adequately manage the growth that we're seeing across the state. We have seen in areas that have grown um, population-wise that the local governments are having to increase property tax rates in order to build the schools and roads and different, thing, and different services like that that they have to do, deal with when that growth happens. So we're going to be involved in conversations about making sure that local governments across the state can adequately pay for the things that they need as the state continues to grow. And finally, the funding mechanism for all the things we've discussed today, the budget. And there are a few programs in, within the Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Develop, Business Development Program that we not only support but would love to see some increased funding for. Um, that's the Tennessee Ag Enhancement Program, which is a cost share program to make long-term investments into Tennessee farms and communities. And for every dollar spent in that program, $6.55 is contributed back to the local economy. So we'd love to see that that program continues to thrive. This year, these applications are going to be fully online, and we look forward to supporting our friends at the Department of Agriculture. The other program is the Agriculture Enterprise Fund, which is grants for starting or expanding agriculture, food, or forestry businesses to further spur job creation and economic development. And the investment in these communities is huge. For every dollar spent, $17.55 is contributed back to the local economy. As always, there'll be issues that we don't know right now that will pop up during this next year. So it's very important that you stay engaged with your lawmakers. If, you're, if you are not signed up for the legislative alert, talk to your county secretary. Make sure you're signed up for the legislative alert. That's how we send out weekly notices about what's going on and, and make sure you know what's going on in Nashville. And um, we appreciate your and advance your, act, your activity and being involved and in contacting your lawmakers. With the legislative session full swing, it's definitely time to make contact with our lawmakers and ensure our voice is heard on Capitol Hill, especially on these priority issues. We hope so far you've enjoyed hearing important updates and have gained some insightful information about our hot topics in the world of agriculture this year. When I open up to any questions anyone has about any of the subjects thus far, if you haven't already, text those to 931-262-2477 and be sure and plug your, your county name in so we can give you a shout out. We have several staff here to help answer questions. So we've got a couple of questions here we think we can combine them. The first one is from DeKalb County. Uh, under the new sales tax modernization law, are taxes due on building supplies for farm shops? And another question on that particular subject from Washington County, what can be done to get retailers on the same page as the new ag sales tax exemptions? Issues with some not, not honoring the exemptions for oil. And I'll ask Kevin to answer that one.
So that's uh, we're very excited about the uh, modernization of ag sales tax that was passed last year. And just like any time there's, there's significant legislation that passes, there are going to be issues that pop up that maybe we didn't know about or, or hiccups in implementation of it. And I think both of these are questions that we've gotten regularly and would love to, to, to address them. Um, so the, the, the first one being on the, um, uh, on the, what to know on the, um, on the building supplies is that um, the law as it's written says that if, as, if you have a sales tax exempt, exempt card, you're, you are eligible to buy your building supplies for your farm shops tax exempt. There is a separate body of law that requires contractors to collect use tax. Um, use, sales and use tax are, they walk like a duck, they quack like a duck, but they're not the same thing. Um, the law looks at them differently. And so the provisions for sales tax, so if you go as a farmer and you buy building supplies and you, you build whatever it is yourself or your employees do, um, then that all that process is tax exempt. There is a different body of law that um, handles um, contractors. Contractors are required to collect the market value of the of the items that they use uh, and collect collect the use tax. So let's give an example of how this applies to other uh, sectors. Uh, the the example that the commissioner of revenue has given is. Uh, Churches. So uh, your church just is a tax exempt organization can buy, can buy things tax exempt. When they go and buy building building materials, if the members of the church build whatever they're building, all of that process can be tax exempt. But when the church goes and hires a contractor, then the, the contractor has col has to collect use tax. And the same thing applies for farmers, even with this law passed. So a, a great a, it's a great law. Again, well, we're very excited that it happened, but there is, there's kind of a, a nuance there because there is a difference between sales tax and use tax in Tennessee law. Second question is on retailers. Um, so there's a lot of information that's out available from the Department of Revenue. And um, the, what I would suggest doing is take the guidance document, which is on our website, it's on the Department of Revenue's website pertaining to how revenue in, uh, implements the law. And it's a, it looks like a really long document. It's 58 pages, but it's got a lot of white space around the edges, really big font. It's really not that big of a, a, of a, of a document when you get down in the degree of it. But I would suggest taking that um, to uh, your, wherever you're buying that from, so exemptions for oil, and your card and explaining that and showing that to them and show them the new law. And then if you still continue to have issues, there is a there is a way to get a tax refund from the Department of Revenue. It's a it's a two page, one page front and back um, form that you send in with your tax exempt information and you can get that money back um, uh, through that process. So hopefully that alleviates it. If you need to get that direct link for that guidance document, we'll be happy to share that with you and um, and the question comes from Washington County. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure you have that, the link to the guidance document. Mr. Mayberry. Thank you again, Kevin. All right, next question is, uh, what are some of the highlights of the governor's proposed budget? I'll ask Shelby Van Oye of Public Policy to handle that one for us tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. And uh, Governor Lee gave his State of the State address Monday night, and there were a lot of things included in that, and there were some really good opportunities for the agriculture industry. Um, just going to hit those top three, and then we'll note some other things that have come through in the governor's proposed budget for this year. Um, perhaps the biggest one is a investment into the Agriculture Enterprise Fund that was mentioned, um, $16.5 million, with 15 of that being a non-recurring one-time investment, and the other $1.5 million um, being a recurring, meaning every year it can be expected to be put into that fund. Um, we thank our stakeholders for helping with that. That was definitely a huge push that we made with both Governor Lee's office and our friends at the Department of Agriculture. Um, second investment to the Department of Agriculture, $1.7 million for emergency prep and response. 
Um, this includes 16 full-time positions to the state vet's office. And as we work to mitigate and navigate through this highly pathogenic avian influenza, I think these positions will uh, definitely be put to great use. And then finally, $167,000 to Camp Clements for maintenance, repairs, and just overall operating expenses. Um, that's the oldest FFA camp in the nation, and, and it's located right here in Tennessee in Van Buren County. So we're glad to see some money go to that as well. Overall, 31 new full-time positions are coming to the Department of Agriculture, including a new staff member in the Tennessee Ag Enhancement Program, um, various support positions, and some positions in consumer and industry service positions if the governor's budget uh, were to pass at the end of session. Um, overall, a lot of eyes are on transportation this year. The governor has proposed $3.3 billion in infrastructure funding. Um, special investments on local road projects is $300 million of that $3.3 billion. Um, so we plan to watch that legislation as it continues to roll out. And then $80 million for a proposed brownfield legislation. If you're not familiar with what brownfields are, it's uh, where they take existing infrastructure in communities that maybe has not been utilized in a while and bring new industry to an area to keep from using those green fields that we mentioned earlier, how crucial that farmland is to our state. Um, so we look forward to monitoring that as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. Thank you, Shelby. All right, here again, we've got a couple of questions here. We, we hope we can combine them together to have one response for you. Uh, the first question from Henderson County is, should we support legislation to protect or restrict farmland transition into development? And then from Putnam County, sadly, we understand that many view farmland as underdeveloped commercial property. What can TFBF do to elevate the importance of farmland and green spaces and the enhanced quality of life farms and farmlands bring to urban and rapidly growing counties? And I'll ask Kevin Hensley if he would answer that Thank you. And I, uh, like we've talked about numerous times, concern over farmland loss was the number one issue when it came to our policy development process. And that's something we take very seriously. And uh, there was new policy put in our, language, put in our uh, resolutions about uh, making sure that we are fully studying this, trying to comprehend it. And that was the big reason why we, we highlighted what UT is doing and TDA and, uh, and, and Farm Bureau are working together to kind of come up with some solutions to that. So when it comes to should we support legislation, I think the first question, the first uh, support legislation to limit or restrict um, farmland going out of production, I think that's a question for you. We're a grassroots organization. Historically, we've always said that uh, it's a private property rights issue and that ultimately we believe that uh, that that private property rights should prevail in, in situations about restricting land use and different things like that. And um, so that's, but that's a, that's a, that's a discussion we need to continue to have solutions that we need to be looking for on farmland loss. Uh, the, the second question kind of to follow up on that, I think I want to highlight again, the, 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 um, the proposed legislation that shall be discussed about brownfields. That's a part of the governor's uh, package. And, and, and we, we are very excited about this legislation. It's legislation that we are, we are, we are supporting going through the process because the, it does several things is it look it it encourages where there needs to be development or where, or where maybe there are communities that need development, that it goes to places that are already developed to a certain extent that, but for whatever reason, whether it's a, a real or perceived environmental risk, the have those properties haven't been developed, those brownfields haven't been developed. And so the state's looking at those um, and making sure that we, if this proposal is successful, that, um, we're investing in those places and not just going to a green going to a green field just because it's easy and a, a, an important part of that bill that i'm very excited about it's kind of in the in in the middle of a, a pretty long bill talks about making sure we conserve green uh, green space um, farmland uh, and and that this is an important it's a it's kind of a policy of the state to do that and so i think there is a shift kind of coming with the discussion about conservation and um, viewing, there, I don't. I think that you're right. There has long time, a long time, been a view that farmland is underdeveloped. 
I think that is shifting in the discussion when it comes to lawmakers and the administration. And that's something we're very excited about and looking forward to be a part of. I uh, hope that answers the question and we get several more coming in. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Mr. Mayberry. Thanks, Kevin. All right, where, and the, the question from Dyer County, where is the effort to increase the cap on Greenbelt? And then we're gonna ask Kevin on that one as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. So um, we haven't forgot about it, but it is still a part of our, it is still a part of our policy. Um, and, and for those of you that have been around for a long time, like like any, any, good, any issue that we face, timing is always important. And so in the discussions that we're having around Greenbelt, we are also having discussions with local government officials about, can we come to a compromise? If you, you know, we've, we've had legislation the past several years to increase the acreage cap, a specifically specific legislation to do that. And we haven't been successful in those efforts to get the bill out of committee. Um, and so we were having those discussions and there are, there are so with the legislation that we filed about the, uh, the, the conservation programs and farms being enrolled in that, making sure that they're eligible for Greenbelt. Um, but we, that's not the main focus of that legislation, but it, we are having those discussions and there are other discussions going on uh, with lawmakers to, to make sure that Greenbelt is set up uh, for the future. And that is something that uh, we're gonna continue to have. And if, if the timing arises for us to get the acreage cap increased, we're gonna, we're gonna work to do that. And uh, it's just making sure that we, we can come to, um, we, we can get that through the committee process and uh, pass on a floor vote. So I'll pass it back over to Mr. Mayberry. Thank you, Kevin. So we're about an hour into this, this uh, webinar. And uh, so we're gonna answer all the questions that have sent in. We've still got a few more in the hopper we're gonna answer, but if, if you need to jump off for any other reason, you got other agendas on your board meetings tonight, we understand, but uh, we're gonna continue on, but uh, no hard feelings if you've got uh, prior commitments or what have you. So the next question, is what is Tennessee Farm Bureau's stance on athletes or entrepreneurs that have no farming interest purchasing farmland as an investment opportunity via leasing the property back to the farmer? That comes from Jefferson County. So we don't have any specific policy on that, but it's a great question. But uh, there's just many, many acres across this country that are owned by non-farming folks that do that as an investment. Uh, it gets into obviously the, the rights of property owners and their right to, to invest and, and to do all the things that they would do to, to make a living. And so we don't have any specific policy on that at this time. Uh, but uh, as, as the, public, the policy season comes up in the coming uh, months, that might be one to, to file back and, uh, and have, have us all talk about it as time goes on. All right, next question. The state is looking at turning CTE ag class size limits over to local board of educations. Is Farm Bureau taking a stance to keep class sizes low? That comes from Fentress County. And I'll ask uh, Shelby, I think is gonna answer that one, Shelby. Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. I think the legislation they're referring to is Senate Bill 197. Um, it is currently, it's been introduced in both chambers, but I don't believe the legislation has moved. Um, in general, we don't have any specific policy one way or another on that legislation. Um, however, we have been talking to a lot of um, agriculture educators throughout the state and met with some representation from the Tennessee Association for Agriculture Educators uh, earlier this week. And um, we're definitely keeping our fingers on the pulse of this situation, but I do believe that there may be some federal guidance that would protect CTE classes such as OSHA guidelines, but um, we are definitely aware of the situation and are going to keep an eye on it as it progresses through committee. Thanks, sir. Don't go far. I think you may have one right behind us here. Does Farm Bureau have any information on the Tennessee Forestry, Agricultural, and Rural Markets Farm cost share? that was announced from TDA. And that comes from Murray County and we'll let Shelby handle that one as well. That's absolutely right. That program has been announced by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. And I think our communications team actually received some guidance on that today. Uh, so I would refer you to the Tennessee Farm Bureau website. I believe there's a scrolling header at the top of the website and you can find more information about that there. 
Good deal. Next question from Hickman County. What is Farm Bureau's stance on animal ID? And we'll ask Chris, Kristen Walker to tackle that one. Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. And this is a good question. It's kind of a complicated question because it can go one of two ways. Um, for a little background, this effort from APHIS is one of a few different efforts to combat animal disease traceability. Um, as we know, there have been issues with high path avian influenza and swine flu, and this is one way to try to get ahead of foot and mouth disease coming to the US and being able to track that down quicker, um, as quick as possible. So with that being a way, one of the ways to address that effort, we do have policy that does support identification efforts to enhance disease traceability. Um, however, we do also support voluntary animal ID programs. Um, the point to make about this is that it's not really changing adding anything to the program. It's just essentially changing the already existing official animal ID tags to be also electronically readable. It might change a couple different classes of cattle that are included, but uh, this is already an existing program and there's also already an official metal ID tag for USDA. It would just make it also be electronically readable. But also important to note, that this is still just a proposed rule. Um, it's not official. There would still need to be a final rule posted. And we plan to submit comments, but also individuals can submit comments. So we're looking to ask for some clarities on different things and um, individuals can also do that too. So um, if you would like more information on that, we can certainly get it for you. Thank you much. In the past few years, there has been great interest in the impact of solar. Where is Farm Bureau with the study that is being conducted on the impact of solar in the state? And what is the estimated time for the release of this impact study? Shelby? Thank you, sir. Um, yes, I think that's a great question. Solar is something that I think a lot of us have had questions on. and that those questions continued to get longer and longer last legislative session as a bill regarding solar was working through committee. Um, so we did ask the Tennessee Advisory Council on Intergovernmental Relations to look into the topic of solar and various different questions regarding its impact on rural areas and agricultural land. Um, we've become great friends of the staff at TASSER through various different studies over the last few months. Um, that study is due September of this year. Um, so to kind of give a little timeline on what will happen from that, TASSER doesn't actually introduce legislation themselves but they give recommendations to the General Assembly where they then can take action if they deem necessary. Um, so we've been working with them throughout this. We've met with different stakeholders in conjunction with them with TASSER. Um, we've met with TASSER individually on the subject. Um, and I believe we plan to continue to do that from now until September. And then once the study is released on final, um, we'll be working, engaging what will happen in the legislature after that. All right, I've got two questions we think we can combine here. So the first one from Lewis County, will it take legislative action for a county to impose an impact fee? And then the next question from uh, Henry County, when you speak of helping local governments adequ adequately managing growth, will this also include educating them in the importance of steering away from productive agricultural land when looking for sites for development and industry? Kevin? Thank you, Mr. Mayberry. And um, so first is uh, on the, from the question about does it require legislation to in, in have an impact fee? And the answer is yes. And that's really why we're getting involved in this statewide initiative and what the, and, and I apologize for the lack of in, of in-depth analysis on what, when we're talking about helping local governments adequately manage growth from a financial standpoint, the, um, the, the language is still being written for the for the legislation and we're we're working with local governments to kind of come up with what that looks like but the current status of where that is when it comes to communities that uh, are experiencing growth they have to have legislative approval from the general assembly before they can enact these types of uh they're known as impact fees so an additional uh, x amount per square foot on a, on a new home being built and we see there are counties already that, that have that approval to do that. Um, I, I can't name those all off for you, but there are specific counties that already have that legislative approval. But what we have seen over the past couple of years in communities that are experiencing growth, 
that uh, the property taxes in those communities are having to go up because the, the amount of growth that's coming in, there's all this upfront cost of building new schools, building new roads, different things like that. And so the communities are, the counties are raising property taxes to keep up with that. And so the, whether it's called an impact fee, there's also adequate facility taxes that, that cities can, can, that city governments can apply. Um, the, the, the kind of the ultimate goal of this legislation will be to make sure that both cities and county governments can have similar type authority about what kind of, whether it's called an impact fee or adequate facilities tax can be imposed when there's new construction in communities. And that's what we're seeing across the state. And we anticipate more of that as the state continues to grow. Now, when we have discussions with local governments, we always talk about the importance of maintaining farmland and knowing the importance of that. There's a, there's a really good uh, statistic that you guys should always have in your back pocket and it's called cost of community service studies. Uh, it's been a little bit since the last time we did a cost of community service study, but uh, generally speaking, for every dollar you as a green belt property owner pay into property taxes, you are paying more than the services you are receiving. And the same thing applies to commercial property. For every dollar that commercial property pays in, there's less services received. And on residential property, for every dollar that resident, residents pay into property tax, uh, it, they get over a dollar back in, in, uh, in services from their community. So we always have that discussion. We regularly remind local governments about that cost of community service studies out there saying that even though, yes, we have a green belt and that, that is designed to keep farmers taxes low, they're still overpaying for the services that they receive from their community. And so we always have those discussions. We're constantly working with ECD and making sure that they understand that. But well, one thing I do want to emphasize in this discussion, and this is the great thing about our, our, our the structure of our organization, is at the that that discussion really needs to happen mostly at the local level. When uh, when there's opportunity for development, that decision is going to happen at the local level. So really want to encourage the county farm bureaus. Uh, to engage local governments when it comes to those types of decisions. I encourage you to be involved. If you have, if you have countywide zoning, I encourage you to involved in, be involved in the planning commission. Uh, hopefully you can appoint somebody to go to that. If you don't have countywide zoning, uh, go to the county commission meetings. There's lots of things that you can do at the local level to help um, encourage what, you've, what the, the question just described about making sure that the local government understands the importance of agricultural land. Mr. Mayberry? Thank you, sir. Next question. What is Farm Bureau's position on solar farms? There is lots of farmland being lost to solar farms. How about using ground that's already used as a right of way, interstate medians and pipeline right of ways? Shelby? Thank you, sir. I think this brings a great opportunity to talk about uh, not only the task for study, but as well as kind of highlight again, um, one of the issues in Governor Lee's proposed budget. So those are great questions about using ground that's used and, and when ground is used, what are the impacts that happen to that ground and is that land able to be farmed again? Um, you're, you're bringing up great points that we are all aware of and have made our questions known to Tasser. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this will be a great opportunity to maybe perhaps use one of the new brownfields that are being discussed um, through legislation on utilizing those facilities that uh, were once booming and are just no longer in use and using those brownfield spaces instead of taking up our, our precious green land. All right, from uh, Lauderdale County. In the currently proposed legislation, if land enrolled in conservation programs lost their green belt designation, would, th would this keep that same land from being green belt eligible when it came out of the said, said program? Kevin? So if I understand the question correctly on this, the, the purpose of this legislation is to make sure that never happens. That, that if this type of, 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 if a farmer enrolls in certain conservation programs that somehow make them ineligible, that we wanna avoid that. But then also if, uh, we were able to pass this. I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be eligible to go back in into uh, the Greenbelt classification. 
Um, and Mr. Bayberry, if, if I take a privilege here, something I want to add to the previous question about solar sites and where they can be. If you remember back at our convention, we had uh, Jeff Lyash, the CEO of TVA, come and speak to uh, at our convention. We've had multiple other discussions with TVA staff before that time and since then. And we regularly talk about siting of solar, about using the, the least productive farmland out there or using spots like that was described and, 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 and kind of think out of the box and not take the best farmland out of production. So it's even though we've got we've got this taster study going, there's lots of other avenues where we are we are in discussions with uh, that. And I want to encourage you to if you are in a, a, a electric co-op, TVA has given um, the electric suppliers the opportunity to produce up to five percent of their own electricity um, on their own if it's if it's considered green energy so that basically means that if they use solar be involved with your with your electric service and make sure that they if they're going to pursue that kind of thing that they are reaching out and finding the best sites and not using good farmland for that mr mayberry So guys, you've done great tonight. Thank you for some very, very good questions. And we've had several good ones. And I hope you'll agree with me that our public policy team has done a great job in answering them. We truly appreciate each of you joining us tonight. We truly appreciate your commitment to Farm Bureau and our most important industry. Please reach out to our field staff if you, don't, if you have anything that was unclear tonight on any issues that we've had. I got one more, one more comment you want me to read? Okay, there's a comment. Glad to see that UTIA is reaching out on, to high schools, welcoming future veterinarian prospects during the summer. Just a comment, Lewis County Board. Thanks, guys, from Lewis County. But again, if you have any questions tonight that didn't get answered or anything that we need to know here that can help you, please don't hesitate to call or reach out to any of us. Together, we can continue to keep our organization strong. Be safe and have a great rest of the evening.